Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here this afternoon. As you can see, uh, we have Matt, John, and, and Andy, and we're going to begin uh, with some remarks by Andy McPhail. Andy? Thanks, Scotty. Uh, you know, typically at this time of year, we review uh, the past season and really what might be on tap for 2020. Uh, but obviously, with the manager change uh, and the timing of that change, we understood that the lion's share of your questions are probably going to be about the manager. So I thought it would be helpful for all, and maybe shortstop some questions, if I could just give you a brief outline of the process that took place to get us here. I would start by saying by about the second half of the season, John started to have some concerns about the direction of the team. Uh, that prompted a meeting with Gabe in late July. And as the season unfolded, by late September, John had become an advocate for change. Uh, one of his chief concerns was how we finish uh, the past two seasons, and, you know, why this season seems to be a month longer than we can play. Uh, frankly, he ran into some resistance. Uh, we requested that he get more information. You know, we thought he needed more points of view uh, before reaching that decision. And he accepted. He accepted our request. And if you know anything about John, if he takes on a mission, he's going to do it in a thorough and thoughtful manner. So he tapped a variety of sources to try to get himself a better 360-degree view of our team. Uh, what he, he quickly learned that he was getting a lot more from the face-to-face -face meetings than he was over the phone, so he resolved to make every meeting going forward face-to-face. -face. This served to really lengthen the process. Uh, John had had a meeting with Gabe after the season. He followed that up a few days later with a long dinner. Uh, and our goal was to try to keep Gabe informed. Uh, Matt was in constant contact because while we understood that it was going to be a lengthy process, our chief concern, frankly, was if we didn't bring Gabe back, we, want, we didn't want to hinder his chances to find a, another job somewhere else. Uh, John finished his mission, you know, and when he came back to give us the download, as anticipated, he heard a lot of very positive things about Gabe Kapler. Gabe was liked and respect it. But what John didn't hear was any explanation of why we were 20 and 36 over the last two Septembers, or more importantly, what was going to be in place to assure that that didn't happen again. So he came back and he made his decision. And we got on a plane, flew to LA, and we talked to Gabe. And now, you know, we turn the page and start another chapter. Thank you, Andy. We have a microphone on, on either side of the room. Uh, all we ask is that you uh, raise your hand uh, and uh, grab the mic before you ask the question. Rob, we'll start with you. John, this question is for you. How much did public opinion factor into your decision, or was this strictly a baseball decision for the best interest of the organization? So, am I coming through? Yeah. So, uh, it's always a factor. You have to be, I've, I've said before over the years, I said specifically when we were up here with Andy talking about Ruben's, the decision with Ruben, that you have to, to kind of know where your customers are at any point in time and, and take their views into account. What is different, I think, about this decision, Rob, is that, um, you know, when I walked around the stadium, when I walk around the streets of Philadelphia and people come up to me, and this is not a scientific you know, marketing survey that is accurate within plus or minus two and a half percentage points. But I will tell you that there were almost, if not as many people in favor of keeping Gabe as they were telling me to, to make the decision that I ultimately made. So it was a part of the decision. I had to, you know, I thought about it, I took it into account. It just wasn't as clear cut as I think maybe some people think it was. Howard? John, when you uh, fired Ruben Amaro, you said it's a results-based business. Right. Gabe Kapler took the hit, and I'm wondering why it was just Gabe Kapler, and I, among other people, are wondering why there's, and I like both Matt and Andy, why Thanks. those two gentlemen are sitting with you today mm -hmm. after what you've done. So I'm going to ask you a question, Howard, and then I'm going to give you some stats. The question is this. You tell me what part of this organization isn't better today, and really substantially better today, than it was four years ago when they came? 
So I'm that's the question. I'm going to look at the minor league system, and I see since Matt's drafted, I believe you have two players that made the major leagues in Cole Irvin this year and Hazley. So outside of that, I'm wondering, there's a feeder system. Other teams have injuries, and they've overcome them. The Phillies couldn't, and I don't think it was all Gabe's fault, but I realized the decision had to be made. But what did he have to support him from your draft picks? So, uh, well, I mean, I've got uh, wait, wait, uh, yeah. the the bullpen's ERA to answer your question in the second half of the season, particularly from the trade deadline on, Howard. Wasn't it the fourth highest, fourth yeah. best bullpen ERA in baseball? So to kind of sit there and say that the cupboard was bare is, is not true, because if that's the case, then what about the other 26 teams that had a worse bullpen? And, and there was no part of this team that was more decimated than the bullpen was. They weren't mass people. So, Howard, I'll, I'll go through this. You, you're talking about four drafts, 16, 17, 18, 19. 16 draft, first three rounds were high school kids. So that's going to retard their impact on how, when it gets to the big leagues. Right now, from those drafts, off the top of my head, you have, to, as you pointed out, you have two players that, that uh, contributed to the team this year in Hazley and Irvin. You also have the only top 100 list I've seen that's come out now is MLB.com. You have three players from that list that are on the top 100 that came from those three drafts. Uh, and in our view, a myriad of other prospects that aren't in the top 100 that come from that draft. To, so to accurately answer your question, you have, to, you have to make an objective evaluation of how that ranks with all the other 30 teams. Bearing in mind that you signed free agents and didn't have a second rounder and a second and third rounder in two of those years. So my overall impression is that those drafts are going to be appropriate for where we drafted and how many drafts we had. Jim, excuse me, Howard, I'd like to make sure we get a chance to go to this side of the room. Jim? John, in your inquisition, what did you hear about Gabe that, you know, brought you to your decision? Look, Jim, not surprisingly, everyone I talked to talked to me on this um, with a strict understanding that this, our conversations were confidential. So I, I'm not going to, can't, I can't tell you what people said in those conversations because, frankly, I'm going to want to talk to people in the future. And if I stand here and, and tell you what people said, I'm not going to be able to talk to people in the future. How, how hard did Andy and Matt push back? You mentioned that when you started thinking change in, in midsummer, you, you, uh, Andy mentioned there was some resistance. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. So in the 40 years I've done this, and I've had situations like this, this was reasonably mild. People, you know, they understood my, my concerns, they understood my issues. Is, is, is your, I mean, this was Matt's signature hire, is your confidence shaken in Matt now that you've had to remove his, his no. hand-picked manager? No. No, I mean, it's, look, we, we, nobody bats a thousand in, in hiring decisions, Jim. Uh, I haven't. Uh, you know, so it's it's early in his career, and he's but he's also I would also point out that he's made lots and lots of really good hiring decisions too. So, no, I'm not. You know, I think what this should be, Jim, is a learning experience. Candidly, I mean, you know, when it's happened in other businesses that I've run, you know, when we've gotten to this kind of a situation, um, people learn from it. It gives me a chance to express my view about standards and and. Uh, in the process and processes and and then looking at you know tough decisions and, and and people generally learn from that so thanks jim john clark well, i'm sorry we're going to the back bob john's much better looking than I am. <laughs> uh, for all of you really so matt matt first you were very sure that gabe was the right person and i, I think you were behind him to the end uh now you've got to go look for a different uh manager John said you're going to be the lead guy in this. Does John have final say? And what do you look for different in this manager than maybe that you thought you really had in Gabe and, and it didn't work out? Yeah, I'm happy to take that first. Uh, so real quick, just, just on cap, and this will feed into a few of the prior questions. I'll just I'll start with this. I don't think this is any secret to any of you in this room or anybody watching on TV at home, uh, but I'm a big fan, and I think he's really good at what he does, very talented, very hardworking, 
um, a good communicator, all, all the things you've heard me say before. And I am very uh, gr thankful to Cap for what he provided this franchise for the last two years. I think when you look at a lot of the ways that we've developed culturally, a lot of the growth that we have had, both you know at the major league level and under the hood that people may not see, I don't think we make those strides if Cap's not our manager. And I know there are a lot of people in this building that work here um, that feel the same as I do. Uh, a lot of people on our staff, a lot of players in our clubhouse that feel that way too. So, I, while I, while I will um, while I say all that, and I do firmly believe that, I also very much understand why we are where we are today. Wins matter. September baseball matters. Whether when you sign Bryce Harper and add JT Muto and have the offseason we had, and then finish as a 500 team, that's tough to swallow. I un I understand that. So, you know, there's been a lot covered in the last lot written in the last few weeks about power struggles and all this uh, these other things I, it, was it John's process that he was going through in the last 10 days of course it was but it was very collaborative like every time he would have a conversation with anybody and I'm not going to reveal what he did either but he would often share that with us share the details with it what he learned which way he's leaning what he's thinking Andy and me we'd have meetings we talked to Cap about it there was this was not John going above everybody's head and, and coming in with an iron fist. It really wasn't. This was as collaborative as it could be, and I understand this. So getting to the, 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 the kind of the crux of your question, Bob, with the with the next manager, I we're gonna be looking for someone who can appreciate the sort of the, the, the organization that we have and the culture that's been developed here. Um, and embrace that, and obviously put their own spin on it. Not every, nobody's going to be exactly like the the guy they're replacing, but someone who's going to appreciate the the staff we have and the and the things that we do, and come in and take us over the finish line because that's really what this is about. This is about wins and losses, and getting us where we want to be. And that's playing in October and competing for a championship. Kevin, John, there were th there's been three moves in the last calendar year where you have been linked as the main driver of the you know obviously the Harper move John Malley and then this move some people would take that as a sign that you maybe don't have the faith in your front office or that you've become an interfering presence in their decision making how do you get over that how do you respond to that um, so boy that's, that could open up a really long answer um, I'm not sure you guys are, have the t patience or time for that. Um, so what I, what I would tell you, Kevin, is a CEO's responsibility, and that's my title, is to ensure that an organization achieves its strategic objectives. And everything I do every day needs to be working towards that end. Um, <clears throat> the, let me go back over this. So if you think about, you mentioned the Bryce Harper decision. Um, look, that's not a, just a baseball decision. That's a $330 million investment. There is not a general manager in the world, in any sport, that has the authority to make that decision. That's a decision that's made, and that's not actually not a decision that's made just by owners either. I'm sorry, by the CEO. That's a decision made with owners and the CEO. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of understand it. That, that decision at that level because it doesn't matter whether you're talking about baseball or football or basketball that decision is not made by a GM um, the, the decision uh, to about John last August was you know Annie mentioned that I started having questions about the direction of the team um, you know and this really had questions started raising them I hadn't been before this but I started raising them with them in the second half of the year um, you know really centered on kind of those three positions that we've now decided to replace. Um, you know, and, and Kevin, the question that I grappled with in, in, the, in the John Manley decision in particular was, um, you know, is there some, well, in all of them, is there somebody, if you, if you replace the person today, do you increase your chances of making the postseason by making the change now rather than waiting to the end of the season? 
The answer was absolutely yes, I thought we could do that. What's different about the Mailey decision was that we had somebody in Charlie who we believe could step in and be that positive accelerator of change. And the reason for that is one, there's few people on the face of this earth who know more about hitting than Charlie does, and two, Charlie knows our lineup really well. He's at spring training, he's, he's kind of a, he's there at the batting cage, you know, during spring training, he's there at the batting cage, you know, at home here, he sits and watches all the games. I mean, he really knows these hitters well. So as you thought about that decision, it was really, it was, it was easier to make because you had that replacement readily available. There wasn't that replacement on the, the pitching staff, right? So, you, you know, you, you could have gone out and maybe you could have found somebody, but the problem is the, the pitching stick coach wouldn't have had the knowledge of the pitchers that Charlie had of the hitters. Um, so, so I, I, look, going back and going back to the last question, the, the question about Gabe, you know, given that my responsibility is to ensure that we achieve our strategic objectives, Whenever you get a group of people like the three of us sitting around the table talking about an issue, I, I, I'm always kind of monitoring, and not just me, other CEOs do this too, uh, are kind of monitoring and, and sensing, are we headed for a consensus or are we headed for an impasse? And as you start to think about you're heading towards an impasse, good CEOs start asking themselves a bunch of questions. Questions like, how important is this decision to achieve a strategic objective. Who among the, us sitting at the table understands or has made this decision most frequently, has the most experience? And what is the track record of each person, including myself sitting around the table? And then how, how, how strongly do each person feel? And then if we make the wrong decision, how quickly will we realize we made a mistake? And once we realize we make a mistake, what are our options to correct that mistake? How long will it take us to make those changes to correct it? How, much, how expensive will it be? And you go through this kind of checklist. And as you think about that, Kevin, and you think about all the decisions that you talk about, sometimes I'll just paint the extremes for you. Sometimes you get a decision over here that says the answer that's described as, doesn't really have a, an impact on our strategic objectives. But there are people sitting around this table besides myself who are much more experienced than I am in making this decision. They have a much better track record in making this type of decision. It's easy to recognize when you've made a mistake. It's quick and relatively inexpensive to correct the mistake. And then at this end, there's the other kind of decision. This, is, this decision has a direct impact on our ability to achieve our strategic objectives, either positively or negatively. It's, it's a decision that I've made lots of times. I have lots of experience with it. I'm really, I've made, I have a good track record of making this kind of decision. You know, you get to those kinds of questions, and, and it might also be, a, it would also be a decision that's very hard to, maybe it takes years to recognize whether you made a good cho choice or not. It might be very difficult and very expensive and very time consuming to try to correct it, if, assuming you can correct it at all. And so when you sit there and you, and you look at the decisions arrayed in front of you as a CEO, you're always trying to figure out, is the decision more on this end or on this end? You know, and if we were deciding whether to f fire a scout in, say, Northern California or not, that's down here. And, you know, that's a decision that if, if I don't want to make, I don't have really any experience in it, I don't have any track record in it, and if we make a mistake, we can correct it pretty fast and, and pretty easily. But if you look at some of the articles that have been written in the wake of the, the dodgers Nats series, you know, the decision about a manager is much more directly connected to achieving the strategic objective of winning a World Series. Just like signing Bryce Harper, just like signing JT Real Muto are much more connected and have a, have a stronger impact on them. So when you get towards an impasse on those kinds of decisions, a CEO not only has the authority to step in, the CEO has the responsibility and obligation to step in. And you're always weighing how, my, how strongly I feel about it, how confident I am in my decision versus the other people that are sitting around the room. And, and, I, and I, felt, I felt that I felt strongly enough about that decision. You know, Andy talked about the process. I mean, I talked to lots of people in, in July and August, too. But, but he's right, you know, I, um, I sat down with Gabe at the, towards the end of it, July, had a long conversation with him, sat down with him for two and a half hours the Sunday of the last game, sat down for five hours with him about three or four days later. And, you know, and, and I just, uh, I kept bumping up Kevin against 
what Andy said is the September collapses. And the problem, you know, the people who were telling me, you know, you have injury problems, you can't blame Gabe for that, that's the reason why you had such a bad season. I, you know, ultimately I felt that if I were going to bring Gabe back, I had to be very, very confident that we were going to have a different outcome in 2020. And those September collapses were just, I kept bumping up against them. And I couldn't get comfortable enough, confident enough, that if I brought him back, we wouldn't have another problem. And therefore, I made, I, I made the decision that I did. Now, I will tell you, just one, I guess, clue thing. What happened here happens every day in businesses. It happened, it's happened repeatedly in my 40 years. I mean, if you talk to the people who, who ran the companies who reported to me over those, you know, 30, 40 years, they would tell you, John steps in with us. He says, no, you can't do that. You're going to do this instead. I've listened to you, but you haven't convinced me. And, I, and you do that. You know, and there's been lots of talk about how that emasculates people. That's, that's nonsense. That doesn't do anything like that. People, this happens all the time. And in fact, it's a learning experience. So, you know, and going forward, there was a question that Bob asked about, you know, the, the search process. What we're probably going to do, because this is what I like to do, is sit down and have a conversation about challenges and where, the, where this organization is and where we want to go. And, and then we're going to kind of create a profile around those challenges and those needs, organizational needs, that says this is a profile of the kind of person we're looking for. And then I'm probably going to, once we get to agreement on what that profile is, I'm going to walk away. And then it's some, you know, I'm always available for questions if there's a problem. And, and probably depends on how it unfolds. Because you don't know as you go through this process, hiring process, whether you're going to have zero qualified candidates, or you're going to have a dozen, or you're going to have two or three. Because depending on where, how many you have, it's a whole different question about how you proceed. And so at some point, Matt and Andy are going to come to me and say, here's where we are. Here's what we think we should do. What do you think? And until I know what the facts and circumstances are of that moment, I don't really know what I'm going to do. I can tell you what happens, has happened in the past in my other companies. When people come to me and they say, we have a candidate, we have three, two, three, four candidates we think are very good or qualified, and we have one candidate who's really, we think is head and shoulders above the others, I'll, I'll look at the resumes, I'll look at the reference checks, I'll, I'll look at the interview notes, and I'll, more often than not, in fact, I can't even think of a single time where I haven't agreed with them that this one person stands out. And if that's the case, I interview that one person, and if, I'm, if I agree with them, that you know, if I, what I see in here backs, is backed up by what they say, you know, then we just we move forward. And I think that's what's going to happen here. And now we go to John Clark. Uh, about when you hired Gabe, it seemed like in the perception, you can correct me if I'm wrong, was you have a front office that heavily believes in analytics, you're putting a lot into it, and you wanted to get a manager who will kind of communicate that with all the players and follow those, that data, those guidelines. And it didn't work out with the hitting coach and the pitching coach, and Gabe is now gone. Would you like to see those next hires maybe not be 100% data analysis, uh, analytics, but maybe a little gut, feel, and other things involved? You want to... I don't know who he's asking. Like, okay. Yeah, so, so here's what I would say. Um, first of all, I think you know, John, you've been around for a while. And we had no analytics department until I kind of came on the scene. So I'm the guy who's driving that bus. Not, not Matt, not Andy, not Gabe, not even Andy Galdi who runs that department. I mean, I'm, I'm the person that was my vision to, to lay it out. Uh, and, and I and the, and the box are the ones who are funding that. So we're, we're, and we're committed to that. In fact, if, you know, if you look at the postseason teams, they're all analytically driven. I mean, the Do you know, if you think of the, the most analytic teams in baseball, Dodgers, Astros, Yankees, A's, Rays. I mean, those, and, and by the way, the, the, if you look at the, the big market teams that are analytically driven, they have analytics departments that are somewhere between 50% and 100% larger than ours. They are enormously committed. This, the, to think that this is a fad that's going to not, you know, fade away is, is, is silly. I mean, I, I think, frankly, the best, honestly, the best example of, of that trend is the San Francisco Giants. I mean, you think they had a, you know, old school general manager and an old school manager who were great. 
They won three World Series titles together. And, and when it came time to hire a new general manager, they didn't go out and look for an old school person. They went out and hired Andrew Friedman's right hand man. The, you know, and I don't know where, I think they're going to probably be like we are, wind up much more hopefully in the center of that, you know, those two extremes. But the San Francisco Giants just indicated where they're heading in their direction. And we need to be there too. You know, we need to, we need to be better at what we do. A lot of the things, so a lot of times it's not so much the data, but it's the delivery of the data, John, that has to be thought through. So we need to kind of, and we need to sit down and talk about that, and that will be a heavy topic of conversation um, with, you know, with the players and with the other, you know, the remaining coaching staff. Uh, and, and when I talk, you know, I was talking to Kevin about kind of creating that profile. This is a central point. You know, two years ago when we did that and created the profile, it was apparent that it was urgent for us to have somebody who could kind of carry our message through through the organization and work with us and be, be a partner in that. And Gabe was great at that. You know, he's paved a lot of road. We don't have the same analytics challenge today that we had two years ago. I'm not saying we don't have issues. I'm just saying they're different. And we're much further down the road. So as you think about the qualifications and the personality and the skill set of, a, of a, the next manager, where we are analytically it is, is different than where we were two years ago, and that's got to be reflected in the profile. John? Uh, this question's for Andy. Uh, back in July when you met with us, uh, you made the comments, if we don't, we don't, referencing the postseason. That's really resonated with the fan base ever since and the perception of the front office. Are you aware of that? Yeah, I know. I'm never going to say that again. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I, I'm glad you brought it up, too. Because obviously, I was prepared for it. If you recall, it was in the context of us chasing our rather ambitious stated goal of being the quickest turnaround for a new regime to the postseason, to match it, which would have been this year. But I wasn't going to chase that goal if it was unrealistic or it came at the cost of our premier young playing talent. Just wasn't going to do it and hence the quote, which I shall not give again. <laughs> but, you know, that was a mistake on my part. I'm not going to do that again. But I was trying to make a point, you know. Yeah, it's our goal. But I, I could not live with myself. If we, and you would, have been very, you would be very unhappy with me two, three years from now if we had done what the only option we had to potentially make an impact on the bullpen or any kind of pitching, you know, to try to get to that one-game playoff at that point. just wasn't realistic. And, you know, the last thing that, and John mentioned this earlier, the odd, you know, this is a difficult game to figure out. Our bullpen at that time, you guys were right to complain about it. We, they were the 24th the worst ERA of the 30 teams. For somehow, some reason, from the trade deadline to the end of the year, their ERA was 3-5-4. They were the fourth best. They improved in virtually every category, you know, so it's just one of those things. But, you know, I learned my lesson. I'm going to have to be just a little more artful in, in how I speak and not give you guys the opportunity, you know, the hammer to hit over my head. Megan. Uh, Andy, as team president, um, how would you describe what your role was during this process and through the evaluation of Gabe? Well, you guys are, you know, that, that are with us every day, probably I have John and I got Matt. They're on different sides here. I gave them my opinion, but then my chief responsibility, in my view, came, we got to find a process here to get everybody back together and unified and all get on the same page going forward. The fact that John did what we asked him to do, and he did it as responsibly as it, and diligently as he did, gives us a lot of comfort. Now we just go back again and we retool and, you know, as I said, we, we find the next manager. Jim. John, you seem to s stop short or indicate that you're not there yet in terms of what you're looking for in the profile of your next manager. And yet, you started considering changes in July. You, you certainly you must have, have a little bit of an uh, idea of what you might be looking for. Can you give us a hint if you're looking experience, if you're looking, you know, uh, uh, Older, younger, new school, old school blend. I mean, something that we yeah. can uh, kind of get a feel for how you may proceed. Would you, would you go new school, out of the box, first timer again? 
So, look, so Jim, the, I understand your, your question, the reason for it. Um, the problem is, you know, you're asking me to opine about the set of facts and circumstances that are completely unknown at this point of view. I mean, we, we certainly know what proven experienced managers don't have jobs and are looking. We also know where those managers have, a, have indicated a preference to go and where, therefore, we're kind of where we are slotted in their personal picking order. Um, that doesn't mean if we're not number one with them, we're not going to talk to them, or at least offer to talk to them, uh, though they don't have to accept our offer. We will. Um, look, I think any time you're in this position, you should be looking to do everything you can to make sure you make the best decision. Um, and you should start. If you have people who are proven you know, managers, you should kind of absolutely include them on your list. But look, there's somewhere out there, there's the next Craig Council, right? And you need to look for that too. So we're going we're gonna to try to find those people as well and unearth them and, and interview them. And I think that's, I go back to what I said, I think it's going to be up to Matt and his staff to kind of go through that process and say, look, here's, here's kind of, here's where I am, it's coming out of it. And you just don't know what they're going to find until they actually do the work. So if you go through all you guys, he, he may want to come in here and pick his own pitching coach, pick his own hitting coach. Will he have that authority? Yeah, but you know what? That's, but that's all on that guy. I, I can't imagine. That's I can't imagine we won't let him. The, the positions are open. Um, but you know, I think that's always Jim, kind of a negotiation between somebody and that person's boss. In this case, Matt. I mean, we're you know, you just you, look. You, you know, in your own business, in your own company, you don't have a hundred percent authority to do stuff. You're, you're kind of negotiating with your boss and your boss's boss on a frequent basis about what you can do, what you can't do, and, and all that. It's not, it's not any different here. Like, if your next manager, Matt, like, he, he wanted to hire a hitting coach that was more traditional, you know, use the middle of the field, think line drive, think hitting 300 and everything else will take care of itself. And that doesn't necessarily jibe with what's being teached from the ground roots up in the organization, a lot of new techniques. Would you hire that guy if he's not consistent with the things that are being teach, taught in the minor leagues? And if you did, would you consider changing the way things are taught in the minor leagues to make it more consistent? Thanks, Jimmy. Sure. So, I mean, I, I'll fall back a little bit on the way I answered a question earlier. I think there are certain there are certain things about the direction of the organization that we're that we believe strongly in, and we're and we're happy with with where we're where we are and where we're going the win total not being one of them, which we've, which we've talked about. I would like to find a manager who appreciates this, a lot of those same things that we appreciate. Um, that doesn't mean we're going to align on 100% of the things. Um, and that's part, that's going to be part of the interview process, is figuring out what, what certain candidates feel about certain things. In your example, you know, a hitting approach or a pitching approach or a staffing approach or just how they run the game. And um, you know, there's no, this is, it's not a cookie cutter position. I mean, there's, there's some nuance to this and like everything else, Jim, that we do, I would expect that hiring decisions will be made collaboratively. Um, but as John mentioned, we have two prominent coaching positions that are open. So upon hiring a manager, those will likely be two of the first things that we set out to do is to, is to fill those positions. And we'll work together, just as we have with any coaching decision we've made, whether it was with Pete or with Cap. Um, you know, if, and if, if organizationally we think that we need to adjust something, we'll, we'll adjust it. And if we like the direction we're going, we'll, we'll stick with it. And that doesn't mean that a year from now we couldn't, you know, pivot in a, in a different direction. These, these things tend to evolve. Matt? Uh, John, you, you've referenced the way that Gabe's finished the season in the last two years as a big reason for firing him, but do you, how much do you see that finish as a, just the talent that he had, and do you think he was really given a roster, especially this season, that belonged in the postseason? So, you know, if, if there were a, a rash of injuries, Matt, between August 15 to 30 and September 1 through 5, I might argue that, I agree with you that um, those were things that were kind of out of out of his control. 
Uh, but that, that really didn't happen. The other thing I think there's probably a misconception is the, the role that the manager and coaching staff plays in creating the roster. Um, so if I can just bore you for a little bit, um, you know, towards the end of the se every season, every coach, every, the manager, every special assistant to, to Matt or Andy, um, all kind like people like Charlie and Larry Boa and Pat Gillick, Jorge Valendia, all fill out an evaluation form on every single player, including those on the DL. And then once those are all assembled, they're distributed, and then, what, 25, 30 of us sit around a room in the big round table and talk about every single player. And the purpose of that is to get collaborative input on how good a player is, what we think he's, he's likely to do next year. And that, that evaluation <coughs> and coming out of that room is the basis for our roster. I mean, if the coaches say, this guy's good and we need him and we can use him, he goes on the roster. And if they say, you know what, we can't, we can't use him, he's not as good, he doesn't go on the roster. Um, so, you know, and, and actually, let me give you a, kind of a, a real life, for instance. Towards the end of 2018, when we had that meeting, and everybody was, the coaches and what now were talking about the pitching staff, you know, Matt gets to an end, a point, and he says, guys, because it all is about, the, the roster is also about off-season trades, and it's about off-season acquisitions and free agency. So we, Matt's looking and he says, guys, where are we on, on free agent pitching? And where are we on trades? And let's talk about who's available and who, who, could, who could be out there for trades or, or when the free agent period begins, who could be out there. And, and you know, we're always looking at that. And we were, when we were looking, when we were talking to uh, free agents, Matt's also checking back with the coaching staff and saying, okay, guys, here's where I am. If, if, if I'm going to sign this person or if I'm going to trade for this person, here's who I'm going to give up in a trade. Here's how much money it's going to cost me, I think, to sign. And if it's, you know, are, are you guys comfortable with that decision? Are you prepared to give up Sixto Sanchez for JT Real Muto? Are you prepared to s spend this money on, on, on a Bryce Harper or an Andrew McCutcheon, which m will then have an, a ripple effect in terms of who else I can sign and who else I can't sign? And so the, the coaching staff has enormous impact on that. So I don't think it's unfair to, to say, you know, they have to own those decisions. Um, that's part of holding them accountable, frankly. Matt, I would add one thing before. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but also it's my part of my job is to try to ob objectively ask that question that you just asked. And if, if I look at acquisitions from the end of last year to this year, whether it happened in preseason or it happened in season, and I try to evaluate us against all 30 clubs. And we have to find a way to measure that, and it's, there is no perfect way to measure, but for simplicity's sake, let's take wins above replacement. The Philadelphia Phillies added, we added 17.8 wins per replacement. That was the best in baseball. Our issues weren't the acquisitions that were new from 18 to 19. Our issues, a lot of our issues were carryover issues. So, so to, you know, to, it's to... Go back, and you can say he didn't do enough, but he was one out of 30. What do you mean by carryover issues? Players we had on the roster in 18 that carried over to 19. And then just the last thing, um, Andy referenced that you didn't, uh, you didn't want to chase the, you decided to not chase the goal before the trade deadline. So If it was unrealistic. It, yes, and, and so the front office is allowed to play the long game. But the manager is then held to the expe expect expectations to make the playoffs. How do you judge to the two parties differently that you're allowed? You're Matt, given Matt, that's the inherent nature of the business, and it's been that way for a hundred years, and it will likely be that way a hundred years from now. That just goes with the territory, and if and if the manager can't handle it or doesn't like it, the manager shouldn't be the manager. That's just reality. Jeff. I guess this would be for John and Matt. It seems like this season you had a lot of players take a step backwards. How much of that responsibility fell on Gabe, even Chris Young, and so on and so forth? But, but when you evaluate the collapse and everything else, how much did that, did you say, I mean, the pitching staff shouldn't be this 
pitching this poorly, there shouldn't be this many issues. How much, in your opinion, in the end, was that on Gabe? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off. I think it's hard to isolate any, you know, any one piece of performance and, and determine exactly why it happened. Um, I think, like you said, we had some players, Andy just alluded to this earlier, we had some to the players that were here in 18 that, you know, performed the same or worse than they had uh, in 19. They performed the same or worse in 19 as they had in 18. Uh, we had some that, that got better, too, like, like a Kingery, for example. Um, but, you know, I, I think, and, and as Andy said, I think that's part of the reason that we fell short of expectations. It wasn't, in a lot of cases, it wasn't the, the newer players. Um, it's impossible to pin that entirely on one thing, or in this case, one person, a, a manager or a coach. Um, you know, we have to look at, we have to look at a lot of factors, a lot of things that led, led up to that. Um, and you know, ultimately, I need to look at look at myself and, and, and figure out if there are if there are changes we need to make. But um, you know, I don't. It, no season is defined by one moment. It is not defined by one player, one decision. It's just there's just too many factors that that play into to a season. Could you follow up with that as well? As well? Yeah. So I, you know, a Andy correctly alluded to the fact that as I kind of tried to uh, come to this decision, I, you know, and I, I, I said, uh, excuse me, I already said earlier that, you know, I kept bumping up against the collapse. I mean, I was trying to figure out why, why do we collapse? Why didn't we win the number of games that we should have won? Um, you know, and I think people stepping backwards instead of moving forwards was part of the answer to that. And I think, you know, I think the coaching staff has some responsibility on it. And let's, but let's be clear, it's, it's, as uh, Matt just said, it's not 100% responsibility. Because if you look at, go to baseballreference.com, pick pretty much any player, pick even Hall of Fame players, and what you see is they have careers like this. You know, Steve Carlton is 27 and 10 in 1972, and he's 13 and 20 in 1973. His ERA is up by almost two runs. His whip is up by like one and a half. You know, his strikeouts are down. His walks are up. His home runs are up. I mean, one of the greatest pitchers in the history of the game didn't just kind of go like this on war and then stay at that plateau for his entire career and then fall off. They just, they go like this. So you're always struggling to try to look, Jeff, at, you know, is this just a down year for, for an otherwise really good player or, or is there another reason? Can I, can I ask one more follow-up for John, please? John, it seems like Gabe's start even here in that first series against the Braves two seasons ago just got off on the wrong foot, made some decisions with Aaron Nola, and then there was a bullpen issue, guy not warmed up in time, things like that. W were there moments where you were even second-guessing the hire of Gabe going back to last season? Um, so Andy and I were together for that opening series in Atlanta. And, you know, one thing I'll tell you and I, is that the facts surrounding the bullpen issue um, are, are on you guys, nobody, there's about five of us who know what happened. Um, and they're not what people, that, what happened is not what people think happened. Um, so, and I'm just not going to get into it because I'm not going to, like, throw somebody else under the bus. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I, th I think when you hire and experience people, you have to expect growing pains. You have to expect decisions that aren't going to be right. Um, and that's part of, you know, part of just life. And we all have that. Every time... I, I don't know about you, but every time I started a new job, particularly a, a, another higher job on the, on the corporate hierarchy, and I had more responsibility and more authority and more people underneath me, it, it's like a player moving from high A to double A. I mean, it's, it's a step up in the competition, and you have to up the game, and you have to you str you struggle a little bit. Um, so, you know, yeah, no, I, I expected that from Gabe, and no, I never looked at that and said, gee, I have to rethink this decision. I looked at that and said, you know, this is what you expect. In a, in, a, in a rookie manager. Okay, we're getting into our late innings, so we'll go with uh, Todd Zalecki, uh, Matt Gelb, and Scott Lauber and see how much time we have after that. Uh, I got two questions. First one's for Matt. Matt, um, certainly analytics is a big part of the game. It's not an anti-analytics question, but how do you know that the information that you're getting from your analytics department is good information? In other words, there are good scouting departments, player development staffs throughout baseball. How do you know that 
you have good analysts and people putting together good numbers, algorithms, et cetera. Uh, because I think a big question coming this season was, how did you guys evaluate? How did you look at that rotation and say, this was a potentially top 10 rotation when it fell way, way short of that? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I think the, um, look, I myself am not an experienced analyst, so I can't necessarily walk into their room and, and point to their formulas and, and find the, you know, the, the flaws in them if they exist. So that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a challenge for anybody. Um, but I think we do a lot of benchmarking. We look around the league, and you can kind of, you can observe what, what, how other successful teams are operating, uh, the types of decisions that they're making, and you can kind of back into how they're arriving at some of, um, um, some of, some of their decisions. Um, and, you know, we can test what we're doing against what they're doing. Now, it's baseball, so even if you have the right information every time and position your players exactly as the numbers suggest that you do, a hitter can still hit it where you ain't, and that can happen sometimes. And a pitcher can know exactly where to throw the ball and uh, have the, you know, try, you know, he can know how to, how, what he should do to get a hitter out, know what his best pitch is to get the hitter out, and he can leave it hanging over the plate and the hitter can, and can whack it. So like everything else in baseball, you're not going to bat a 1,000 at these decisions. But there are ways for us to, um, to check and calibrate what we're doing versus the rest of the league. Now, that's not enough because in order to beat the other teams in your league, you have to be better than those teams too. You have to do things that they're not doing. So there is some element of um, experimentation, uh, trial and error. Um, and some of those things will work, some of those things won't work. I point back to you, a lot of you in the room will remember, uh, particularly early in the 18 season, uh, we were pretty aggressive with our shifting. Um, again, trying to do things that you know, other teams aren't doing. You remember the ball, we're, we're, in, we're in City Field, and Nick Williams is playing very shallow in right field, and Rosario hits a ball over his head, and, and we lose the game. You know, like some of this you, you learn on the fly, and um, that ball didn't, didn't help us win a game. It actually helped us lose a game. Um, but you, you have to innovate sometimes, and not always. Like there are, there are times you, you should not do that. And I think as as we went along the last two years, um, you know, cap adjusted a lot to, for a variety of reasons. Um, we weren't taking nearly the risks at the end of the 19 season that we did at the beginning of the 18 season. Um, but I think to be a forward-thinking organization, you have to be willing to take risks. And I know that that is tougher in this market than it is just about anywhere else. I know that. Um, but if we want to do what John has asked us to do, which is continue to push forward and be a great organization that can compete year in, year out with the New York Yankees, the Los Angeles Dodgers, and the Houston Astros, we have to be willing to continue to push the envelope at times. And we will recognize the realities of our market, but we have to continue to push. And John, uh, you w walked us through your decision-making process with Gabe and John Maley. How, how come it's, is, is it a concern, though, that if you had not been more assertive that we could be sitting here today and Bryce Harper could be playing for the Giants, Gabe Kapler could be the manager, John Maley could still be the hitting coach, Chris Young could still be the pitching coach, uh, the decision to fire Rick Kranitz after last season, those are, those are decisions that I would think would, you know, maybe trouble you or concern you. How come they're, they're not concerning in terms of, you know, letting the people in charge continue to make decisions? I'd like to think I actually bring value to an organization, that I'm not a potted plant sitting in the corner. So, you know, if you went back and looked at what I did starting in 1979 when I walked out of business school, I'm not doing anything differently today than I was doing then. I was challenging people. I was saying I don't agree with your logic. I don't think you've analyzed it properly. I think you need to go look at it this way. I think you need to get this information. And I, and I would push. And you know what? The guy who I was pushing most back in 1979 was my father. Um, so, you know, this is what CEOs do. There is, you know, if you, you wouldn't have a need for a CEO if everybody in that organization made every decision correctly every time. Decisions correct? I'm sorry, what are big decisions? Uh, you know, you, you push to get Bryce Harper signed. Yeah. You push to get Why do you Kapler think there's fired. a CEO? We're paid to make the big decisions. We're paid, I, I said, we get paid to ensure our organization meets its strategic objectives. Signing Bryce Harper 
is a, there's a direct link between that and achieving a, a strategic objective of winning the World Series. Signing a relief pitcher for one year for $2 million it doesn't have the same impact. I'm not touching that decision. I don't even think I want to know about the decision, frankly. And I certainly am not going to have input into the decision. So, I, yeah, the big decisions is exactly where CEOs have to be. Those are the decisions that make a difference. And that's what I get paid to figure out. Matt Gill. Uh, this is for Matt and Andy. Matt, you just spoke about the market realities of Philadelphia. But I guess I'm a little confused because there are the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Astros, which are very large market teams, have taken these forward-thinking approaches, and they have uh, installed very uh, extensive data-based uh, approaches. Do you think that it's this market that is holding you back? That the reason that Gabe Kapler is no longer the manager is because of the expectations of the market, or I'm just I'm a little confused there. I don't I don't think that. I think those are your words, not mine. I think my, what my what my point is in in ask, answering Todd's question is that we John has John said this himself. I'm paraphrasing what he said earlier here, but John has uh, a very clear goal for this organization to win a championship. And four years ago, and still today, uh, his goal is to be, you know, at the forefront and, and on the cutting edge of, of how we're going to do that. And he has he provides us with the resources, he and he and the rest of ownership provide us with the resources to do that. And we need to continue to push. And that was my point: is that we just we need to push. Yeah, I don't know what your source of confusion is, but I would tell you, from my, you know, my perspective, this market is great. I mean, we. We were an 80-win team last year. We drew 569,000 plus more this year than we did last year. You know, based on the off-season acquisitions, the fans responded great. Our TV ratings are up 21 percent from where they were ago, the best since 2012. This market is not an issue at all. If, if it, it's a, it's a plus. Go ahead. Sorry. What then were those market realities that you're referring to then, in terms of? I, I mean, I think back to like the exchange uh, the cap had. I think with you guys, I wasn't in the room. Just about being like Dallas Green, and I'm not like Dallas Green, and maybe some more colorful language. Like I, there's, you know, the cap had a hard time gaining acceptance. You know, and I don't. I don't think I'm telling anything you don't know, but. Okay. Another. Yes, we have we have time for one more. Scott Lauber, I'm sorry, we're going to have to end at this because we're we're at an hour. I apologize. Andy, I, I think in the past you've talked about the re relationship between a manager and a general manager and how important that is. So while John outlined a collaborative process by which you'll choose the next manager, how important is it to you that Matt is you know fully on board with that choice? And Matt, um, how confident are you that you will be at the end? So I would think. I don't think there's a relationship more important in a baseball organization than the manager GM. I mean, just the day-to-day. -day. If those two aren't simpatico, you know, you really have issues. I believe it's John's and my goal that, you know, Matt go out, start the search. At the end, he's going to have to have the approval of John and I, just like with Gabe. We had, John or I could have vetoed Gabe. We chose not to. Uh, but you know, I can't imagine us hiring somebody that Matt is not fully on board with. And there might be a variety of guys that fit that criteria. And then maybe John and I will have some influence on, of the guys that fit that criteria, who, who we think might be the best fit. But it, it's got to emanate from the GM. Okay, we are actually in extra innings because uh, Dave didn't get a chance to ask his question and then Jimmy had one and they both promised me they'll have short questions. Uh, th this is for John, and it deals with one of the sub-themes of the season that falls under the umbrella of accountability. Um, what did you make of how Gabe handled the multiple hustle incidents this season, and how would you like the next manager to handle them? So that was one of the things I talked to Gabe about in July, when I <clears throat> met with him at the end of July, um, and, and Gabe made a concerted effort to improve. You know, it, it's a tough question. So the question is whether I want to point out what happened on another team. Th th let's just say there was a team, a playoff team, that had a problem before the playoffs, and a player didn't hustle and was benched. 
That same player didn't hustle in the playoffs. He wasn't benched. You know, you treat you got to treat those two situations differently. So, um, you know, I think I think Gabe understood my point. I think Gabe tried to address my point. Um, and I think, in fairness to Gabe, there were times when he, just like the manager of that other unnamed team, decided not to do something or to do something. So, and that's just, and look, that's what, that's what the manager, frankly, gets paid to do. They're field generals. They're, they're in battle. They've got to make decisions on the fly, in the, in the heat of the moment. Um, and, and I think, you know, to Gabe's credit, he, and he has a good staff around there to, to advise him. I think he generally made those decisions well. Jim. John, do you expect this team to contend next year? Will you be playing in the deep end of the free agent pool again this winter? And how much of a concern is the luxury tax? Would you go over that to make <laughs> those three sorry, Thanks, thanks for sorry, making was, that was three questions. Was that yes. one short question did I hear, Scott? <laughs> uh, that was what the <laughs> promise was, I believe. Would was you like not, to pick the most important question? Before you, before you put the question mark? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even sure I remember the first question, Jim. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I do. Will you be active in, in the deep end of the free agent pool? So we'll have to just see what the deep end, how the deep end is defined once we get to the free agent period. We don't know. You, do, you and I don't know sitting here today who's going to actually be a free agent and who's not. There's a few good ones. Now, listen, there's nothing that prevents a team from signing its current player before the free agent period, Jim. Nothing. So you don't know who's going to be a free agent. How about the tax? Yeah, so so my my view um, is that if look here's what I'm not going to do I'm not going to go over the luxury tax to, so we have a better chance of being the second wild card team that's not going to happen I I think you go over the, the luxury tax when you're fighting for the World Series you know if 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 you got to sign Cliff Lee and that puts you over the tax you do it if you have to trade for Roy Holiday and sign him to an extension that puts you over the tax you do it you know you but you don't do it for like a little game. Okay, thank you, John, Andy, Matt. Appreciate your time. And thank you all for being here with your thoughtful and multi-part questions today. Appreciate it, everybody. Have a good weekend. It's an hour. Yeah.